Hello, hello, everyone. Welcome back. I am one of your co-hosts, Rika Borrego. I am your other co-host, Tony Borrego. And this is the podcast known as Relatively Sound, a podcast where you can have it your way. Now, today's episode, we are tackling the second album for album episode for the month. And it is my recommendation, uh, Phoebe Bridger's second studio album titled Punisher. And Tony gave it some listens over this last week or two. And you shall be hearing his response to it. Briefly, I just want to say that I picked this album for you because a couple of reasons. One, it's a more recent album. It's, it's by a kind of a newer artist. You know, it's only her second album and it's her most recent album. It came out in 2020. Uh, and I know that you have probably not been listening to as much new music as opposed to discovering maybe older bands as of recently. So I thought oh, it'd be kind of cool to give you a not only newer artist, but also like a newer album. And the second main reason is because Phoebe Bridgers, one of her biggest influences is Elliot Smith, who I know is one of your favorite, you know, singer songwriters of all time. And I thought it'd be interesting for you to hear maybe her take on his style of music or just, you know, her take on, her own music that is possibly, you know, inspired by Elliot Smith. And I just thought it would be a completely kind of 180 from last month's um, Fully Completely, which I think is just a more solid rock album where this is kind of more singer songwriter, you know, got a gentler sound. So what were your overall first thoughts when giving this album a listen well, going in with the impression that there would be similarities to Elliot Smith's music, I definitely, you know, was excited for it. And those were some of the things that I kind of listened out to. Not not that I was trying to take that statement literally like it's going to sound like him. But I did kind of go in with that mindset and also knowing that it was going to be a little slower paced. So overall, well, let me preface this. I don't really like like the name Phoebe that much. So I, there was a part of me that was worried that I wasn't, wasn't going to like the album because of that. I know that sounds ridiculous, but I feel like there's just small things that can really influence how you perceive an album. That's a little superficial, but okay. Well, so the album for me was actually inspiring. I enjoyed it. And, you know, I think it was inspiring as a songwriter. And I did think there was a lot of moments, you know, that I feel like I could maybe connect in my own way. And I guess in turn, what I'm trying to say is that um, as a songwriter, I enjoyed the album. And as a listener, you know, with emotions, I enjoyed the album as well. Well, what on, on first listen, what did you think? Because I'm kind of thinking I was your feeling towards it maybe after like your fifth listen. But on your very first listen, were you kind of questioning why I gave you this album a little bit? Well, okay. So the opening song, well, the o- opening track is DVD menu, which is initially I was like, this is a slow start for what I'm assuming is going to be a slow album. And honestly, even though it really does kind of sound like a DVD menu, it was just kind of kind of boring for me. Like, I was like, I'm hoping that maybe it um, gets a little catchier. But, you know, it's it was only for a minute, and it does transition into, like, the first actual song pretty well. It did set the vibe success. success oh my gosh. Successfully. And I think that actually brought a lot of promise to me with it because I thought, oh, okay, she was able to do sort of, like, a prelude and make it thematically fit the album theme, but make it transition. So that alone got me excited. Um, The the first real like thing that I really enjoyed was I liked the focus on the lyrics. Not, not that I'm not a lyrically driven person, 
but I felt like I was really able to hear the lyrics well, but I didn't feel like the vocals were annoyingly loud. Um, although I suppose like the instrumentation does get a little buried at times, but like overall first listen, I did enjoy it. I I guess I just kind of felt that maybe some of the songs blurred together a little too much. Um, kind of like you could take one of the songs and then just switch the lyrics from a different song on there. And then it would kind of be the same. What was your first listen like Rika? Um, well, yeah, I guess to briefly give my background with the album, um, uh, my first taste of the album was hearing um, one of the singles Kyoto on the radio in the car. And I was like, Hmm, this is catchy. I don't mind it. And knowing it was something newer at the time when I heard it, probably in 2020, I was like, oh, this is interesting. And then I went and listened to it probably on Spotify on my own. And I was like, huh, I like this enough to give her other songs some more listens. And, you know, when I like found out that, oh, this is only her second album, she's relatively new. I'm like, well, let me just, normally I would go back and listen to the first album first, but I was like, this one's brand new. I'll, I'll give it a listen. And I guess I, I had similar thoughts that you did on first listen. I was a little like hesitant because I was like, it's some of the songs I agree kind of at first do blend in together because there's, I would say there's like kind of three more upbeat songs on the album, Kyoto being like the most upbeat one, but a lot of them are kind of slower pace. And it, well, I probably on second or third listen is when I really started to get into the lyrics. And then probably on my fourth or fifth listen is when I really started to get into the production of the album and some of the instrumentation. And that's kind of when it all started to blend together for me. So um, but I, like I said, I like Kyoto so much on first listen that I was like, oh, even if I don't like the rest of the album, I like this song. So was there any song on first listen that kind of stuck with you? Um, I, I did really actually enjoy Garden Song a lot. Um, the first song on the album after DVD menu. Um, and even though you could say it's maybe it's kind of an underwhelming song in some aspects. You know, I just felt like that it was like, that was a good, solid introduction. Um, as far as which song jumped out to me the most first listen would definitely be Kyoto. Um, you know, cause I, I really like that keyboard sound they do in it. Um, you know, there's drums in it, which not all the songs have. Um, I, I really love the lyric in there about saying that like, um, her brother got a call from you wishing him happy birthday, but he was off by like 10 days. Like that is what really made my ears kind of, you know, perk up and got me, got me excited, you know, to listen to the rest. And not that I wasn't excited, but it was just kind of like, oh, you know, what else is going to come out of this? And is that a song that you think you like? have down lyrically like what it's about i'm gonna be very honest here if if you were to ask me what any of these songs are actually about i'm pretty sure i'd be wrong about most of them and that's not because i don't know what the lyrics are and that's not be- and it's not because i haven't like actually just looked at the lyrics and stuff I just, I don't know. I feel like they were hard to kind of settle on a conclusion of what it actually means. It seemed almost to me more like, you know, little, little memories or moments that happened, which I think actually, I I actually really enjoyed about the album. I felt like it made it have a lot of personality, which I can't say about every album I've heard. Well, I will say. What is Kyoto about? Well, a lot of the lyric, a lot of the songs, I think you do have to like read the lyrics. Cause I, I, one thing about this album that I really love and on my, I gave it a, you know, a listen today to prepare for the episode. And one thing that I really appreciate is like, I don't think there's like any wasted lines. Like I think every line is like, even the lines that are maybe a little more vague or maybe not as like unique, like still fit in the overall like, perspective of this of the song nicely and you know kyoto that i think is, is one of the easier songs on the album 
because it's kind of like a it's it starts off in a setting you know it's her and her band were on tour um in japan and they were in kyoto and you know it's literally like the lyric says like you know they went to the arcade but she didn't ended up going and she ends up going to a payphone and uh calling her dad who you know and this song is like based you know it's autobiographical you know she you know has you know certain relationship with her dad um you know he tells her about him getting sober and how he wrote her a letter but you know she hasn't read it yet and basically you know as the song goes on the second verse as you mentioned you know she's talking about her little brother and just the fact that the you know their father you know maybe wasn't around and you know calling miss calling on the wrong date you know uh for the brother's birthday and it's the core what i love about the song is like the chorus because like it, she's like kind of telling her like stories or little you know bits and pieces of her childhood and stuff but then like the chorus just has a lot of like very really relatable lines like the line i'm going to kill you but if you don't beat me to it you know there's a little bit of you know like comedy in there but i guess kind of like dark comedy because it's like She's joking, but is she really joking? Um, the, the comedy on this album was something that I appreciated, and I thought it was done. I thought they nailed the balance of it, where it's not absurd. It doesn't take you out of the song, but it is legitimately worth a chuckle. Yeah, because it is like kind of like I said, like it's a little bit like dark humor because it's like it, you chuckle over there, and you're, you're kind of like maybe I shouldn't have laughed at that, like. Um, in the second chorus, she sings, um, I wanted to see the world through your eyes until it happened. Then I changed my mind, which is kind of like another line where it's like, she's specifically talking about her dad, but it's also, you can have it really about anyone. You like, you can, it could be like, you know, you thinking about like, uh, someone you look up to when you're younger, you know, or like, a. A celebrity that you look up to and you know you think you want to be them and then if you ever when you do become them or you do see the world through their eyes you're kind of like oh this, this isn't what i imagined and it hits even harder when you're talking about like a family member so um so like that song at least for me I, when i when i looked into the lyrics and it was like okay yeah she's talking about her dad that one's easier but i i will say some of the other songs are a little harder um, like you were talking about Garden Song, um, you know, was, it, was that a song too that you kind of didn't know what it was about? Um, I guess I would say so because she starts off talking about like it sounds like someone that she likes or you know, or at least some dude in her life, and like she's like hoping that one day you know like she could like live with him and have like a garden that's great right um but i also know there's a part where she like um she had gone to the doctor and like she checked her liver for how much resentment she has like i'm you see they really these songs really have like fragments you know like little bits and pieces here and there which i think give sort of like this elusive quality but it does make it hard like to answer it answer what the question is what does it mean you know and i get that yeah and i think some of it cuz i was doing a little research on the album today and some of these songs she wrote like on the road and a lot of it she did have bits and pieces and between her and some other songwriters people in her band um she started to kind of like fully flesh out the ideas of these songs this one in particular, um, Garden Song, is about um, a nightmare that I guess she kept having while on tour, specifically. Um, but you have like bits and pieces in the song that are like based off true true events. Like in the first line, um, she talks about um, she's talking to someone about their skinhead neighbor going missing. And basically, like, saying, like, implying that 
she, you know, she killed him and, and buried him in the yard. And then the flowers growing on the, in the garden is like growing on top of the skinhead, which is a little mm-hmm. morbid to think about, but it's, it's really cool, different imagery, you know, like you can have anyone sing about a garden and about flowers and be cliche. Right. But like, I feel like in this song, it's like, there's different meanings and specifically, again, you were talking about the line near the end of the song where um, back her going to the doctor. And again, I think that's just like um, looking into the line specifically, um, I guess in some like Chinese uh, medical practices, like that's something that they do. Like they put their hands over like certain body parts and apparently they can like sense certain like, like, resentment or whether it's growing inside of growing inside of you and stuff like that so um again it is like kind of bits and pieces that are kind of thrown into these songs that kind of give them a little bit of like a, a charm um now i i want to shift gears a little bit because um you know going into this album i i did want to just tell you about the Elliot smith Elliot smith influence because I, and I should, probably shouldn't have, because it would have been more interesting to see if that would have been something you picked up on. But, I, you know, I don't necessarily think a lot of her songs necessarily sound like Elliot Smith, but I do think if you listen to them closely, there's probably more influences. And that, I mean, that's someone that's coming from me, who is someone that I'm not that well versed in Elliot Smith. You know, I know I've listened to like a somewhat of a greatest hits album by him. And um, I've listened to, either or a good amount, but I have not really dived in, you know, delved into his other albums. And I did tell you though that there's one song on this album that is specifically written about him. And I'm curious if you were able to figure out what song that was. I may have forgotten that you said one of the songs was written about him, but I did determine which one sounds the most like an Elliot Smith song. Okay, which one sounds the most like an Elliot Smith song? Now, the one overall that wins most Elliot Smith like, it is Savior Complex. Okay, I had a a feeling you were going to pick that one as the one that sounds like it. Because there's a lot of, you know, it's it starts off with acoustic picking, which is common in a lot of his songs. Um, Chord progression wide, there's a couple of moments, particularly. you know, major to minor type of yes. progressions. Um, even th- there's more z- songs on this album that talk about lyrical ideas. Well, I'll g- I'll get into that in a minute. But in that song, they uh, she says something about she's too tired to have a pissing contest. And to me, that's one of those kind of punk type lyrics that like I feel like Elliot throws in his songs a lot just to give the song just a wee bit of edge. Um, and then that that main tag of the song, when she says "Savior Complex," the way she says it is just how Elliot would have said it. Yeah, and I I totally I know this was a song on first listen that I really liked the specifically like you were talking about the chord progression because going from that major to minor, just like you know, and a lot of songs do that, but. Whenever it's done well, it just, it always hits the spot. For Um, real. But yeah, that song has great melodies within it too. Not just the chord progression, but like just, I feel like the melodies are really strong in that one. And that is a song that is like more, it's one of the slower songs. It's And that one's very bare bone. That one doesn't really have, it has some other like, um, it sounds like another type of guitar, like, not maybe being played with a slide. I don't know. There's something going on in that song that's like interesting, but yeah, there's like no drums. There's not, there's not a whole lot of other guitar um, in the song, but so even on that one, I agree with you probably is definitely one of the songs that sounds the most like Elliot Smith. It is not the one specifically written about Elliot Smith. That actually goes to the title track. Really? Yes. So, elaborate, uh, please. Yeah. So, I, I'll I'll elaborate it, and then I'll I'll ask you for you know what how you felt about the song. But 
So first, she in the, in the first line of the song, first of all, she says when the speed kicks in, which, you know, speed is, you know, pretty much another, you know, name for, you know, meth, um, drugs, you know. And wait, wait, which Elliot's dropped that in a few songs? Yes. Um, because I, when I did the research, because I, again, I don't know a ton of Elliot Smith songs besides the few that I know. Um, I, it said that he mentions that particular drug in one of the songs called Saint Idol's Heaven. Saint Idol's Heaven. Saint, okay, there you go. Thank you. And in that song, he also mentions 7 Eleven, which is in like one of the first lines of Kyoto, right? Yes. Which I didn't know that. So that, that is, see, another kind of connection right there. Um, but in the, in the first verse, she sings about walking past the house where you live with Snow White. And, um, this is in, a specific reference to a set of cottages in the LA area that actually inspired the Disney movie Snow White. And apparently that's also where Elliot Smith used to live um, at a time of his life. Oh, really? Huh? Yeah. And again, Snow White is also a, like a, um, could be as a slang word used for like cocaine, which is, I guess, supposedly another drug that Elliot maybe used or, you know, wrote about in his lyrics. And um so, so that's like a specific reference, but to get more kind of deeper into it, you know, Elliot Smith was someone she discovered and fell in love with, but it was after he had already passed away. Right. And, right, right. you know, similar to actually, you know, you like, you know, when you and I first heard of him and we listened to his music, it was way after he had passed away. And, um, you know, he became one of Phoebe's like, you know, favorite artists. And in this song specifically, she was like, in the chorus, she's like, what if I told you that I felt like I knew you, but we never met? So that's specifically like talking to him as if he was still a, like here physically. And in her mind, she was like, the song's about him, her having like a conversation with him. And um, Punisher, the name of the song and the album, is kind of a made up term she came up with for pretty much like a a super fan of someone so like you know nowadays the term that people use is like the word stan right you're yeah. a stan or something which which comes from an eminem song but it's like she but you know this came out in 2020 i think maybe maybe a year before stan really became popular and she kind of made her own version of it which is a punisher and specifically even more specifically punisher is a super fan that like meets meets their idol, meets the person that they're fanning over and just won't sh- will keep talking to them and just won't shut up because they love them so much. So she imagined if she ever did meet Elliot Smith, she would just like blabber on and on and on because, you know, she loves his music so much. And in the second verse, um, she's talking about, um, hearing about stories of him being at the bars and even when he was looking his worst um he was always like really nice to the punishers so his fans which is one thing i have heard about ellie smith was that he was a really like quiet but really kind person even when he was kind of on his down and out moments you know um and then even more specifically too um, she kind of she kind of feels like he she's kind of can connect with him because there's a line too that I love in the pre-chorus where she says, "I swear I'm not angry. That's just my face." Which, um, you know, some people online said that like Ellie Smith maybe didn't look like he was the most like, you know, a person that like looked really happy. You know, he kind of maybe looked a little tough or a little mean, but. That was unapproachable. Yeah, unapproachable. Exactly. But that was not the case at all. Um, and, you know, then there's a the line in the second chorus where she says, but we never met and 
and it's for the best because again, kind of going back to that um, other line we were talking about, about like, you know, meeting your idols and your heroes. Sometimes when you do that, it, it doesn't always plan out the way that you're expecting it to. And, you know, maybe, you know, she think she thought she would, like I said, act kind of embarrassing towards him because she's such a fan of him. And again, the outro, she says, I can't open my mouth and forget how to talk because even if I could, wouldn't know where to start, wouldn't know when to stop. So even though there are like little references, I, I could see someone who maybe like me doesn't know a lot about Elliot Smith wouldn't know what the song was about before listening to it. Like, when I first listened to the song, I didn't know it was about Alice Smith until I read about it afterwards. Because usually when I listen to a song, or specifically an album, I do research on it, especially on the songs I'm interested about. So um, I'm curious now if, if that song makes any more sense to you on just what your overall thoughts on the song when you first heard it. It, it makes total sense now. Thank you for explaining that. Um, I, I do feel a little disappointed in myself. I, I feel like I should have picked that up. Um, because whenever I heard that line, I'm not angry. You know, I swear it's just my face. I actually kind of thought of like, oh, it's kind of like Elliot Smith vibe. Um, I, it was a little hard to maybe choose that over some other ones. Like if I was trying to fish out the Elliot Smith song. Because I feel like a lot of her songs sound like she's talking to a male protagonist. Not saying that's true, but just kind of just listening. Um, but also, I think a reason I didn't really catch it is because it's my least favorite song off the album. Interesting. Now, is it because of the music? Because I this song is probably the one that's like sounds the least like Ellie Smith in the sense that it's like got is. It, as far as I remember, there's mostly just kind of like keyboards. And I do know I did some research and the way they recorded the song was interesting. Like they recorded a ton of kind of like the instrumentation and then went back and like in the production of it, like really used a lot of like phasers, which as someone who's not a producer, I like vaguely know some of that type of stuff. Uh, she specifically said she was writing the faders. Um, they use like a Mellotron and they back mask some of her vocals and they faded up in and out through the song. There's some samples. It sounds of, like, like they birds. use like, sounds like they use an octave unless there's actually a dude with the super deep voice doing backup vocals on Garden Song. <laughs> oh, no, they're, no, Garden Song. Okay. I, and I forgot to mention this during Garden Song. Garden Song, it is the guy singing it. Um, it's her, because remember I told you the song was about her having like a recurring nightmare when she was on tour. Right, right. She wanted to have like a um, harmony in the song. And she went to her touring manager, who I guess is this like Dutch dude with a really deep voice. And he just sang the chorus with her. Oh, okay. That That's a fun little fact. I like that factoid. I didn't, and, I, and it's weird too because I didn't catch that vocal the first couple of times I heard it because Garden Song is a song that I, was one I liked a lot on first listen because it kind of has this like a little bit of like a driving, but even though it's like not a fast song, it has this like almost like really soft kick drum kind of element going with it along with like the guitar picking. And it's very, I don't even know if it's a real drum kick, kick drum. I don't know if it's like a, I have no idea how they recorded it, but it does have this kind of hypnotic beat to it, even though it is a pretty just simple sounding song. Um, not, not, not to, um, I'm glad you oh, sorry. That up. yeah. And not to digress too much, but speaking about like the drums, um, despite there being, you know, very little drums throughout the album, I actually did really like the production on the drums. I know that, you know, there's this very strong ambient throughout the album and i think it's really moody and nice but i would say that at times it gets a little murky a little bit kind of too far in the background but i think when the drums came in they were able to have that you know soft gentle quality while still kind of you know being big and you know being drums so um and an example of, of like me liking the kind of Murphy production is actually the beginning of Punisher. 
I really do like that, like, I can't remember if it's like a piano or something, that intro. I think that is very pretty, but as a song, I think it's just kind of boring and not super engaging. But maybe it's a grower, who knows? Well, I'm, I might be growing now. Well, you that might you know. know. That, well, it might be growing now that you know that it's it's about Elliot Smith. It was a song I always liked on first listen. Actually, out of all the slower moments, it was one of my more favorite ones because it. I really like the chorus. It like has these almost like strings in the background, and they kind of swell in a little bit. Because uh, I like the verses where it's like her kind of more storytelling, right? Like these lyrics and a lot of the lyrics have almost like a storytelling quality or almost like reading. She's like singing or reading word from like a journal. And that kind of maybe kind of you're talking about like it has a little bit of like fragment kind of a fragment feeling to some of the songs. But then the chorus, it is like the music kind of is different than the verse and just like the overall atmosphere of it, it's it's a little lighter, where the verse kind of has more of like the heavier production. So I, I do think it has a nice contract, but I could see why it is your least favorite because it is one of the more just like plain tracks. Where Garden Song has a lot more going on with it, just musically, like it has, like I said, that kind of kick drum thing going on. It has like you know, kind of more guitar plucking and keyboards in the background. And, you know, Kyoto definitely is by far like the, the rocker on the album. And, you know, it's, and it's funny because her first album, which I have listened to multiple times, not as much as Punisher because I, I much prefer Punisher, but her first album has even less upbeat songs. It's a lot more slower songs like Punisher. And she said that when she was writing Kyoto, it started off as like a slower kind of ballad song. And then she kind of felt tired of doing this type of song. So she just turned it into like an upbeat rocker, which I think serves she nailed it. Well. Um, but well, be- before we move off Punisher, um, I, I do want to point out that, uh, you know, I thought about there's even more songs that could maybe be about Elliot. You know, if I was just going off some of the lyrics, um, there's a song where she's talking about um, hating this part of Texas. You know, there's an Elliot Smith song where he says, when you live in a southern town where all you can do is grit your teeth. That's where he's from. Um, there's a song where she's crying because someone's talking shit about John Lennon. That was one of his big influences as well. Um, there is, uh, I think it's in China. I mean, Satellite, when she's talking about she wished she wrote a song, but instead she'll just learn all the words, which I love that lyric. That was one of my favorites off the whole album. Lyrically, you mean that particular line? Yeah, that particular line. Yeah, those are, I'll, I guess I'll address the Texas line really quick first, because that line is, is the first line in the last song on the album. Um, I know the end. Oh, wait, I thought it was in, is it not in Graceland? No, she, so yeah, oh. she mentions Texas and Graceland, but the line specifically you're talking about, the somewhere in Germany, but I can't place it, man, I hate this part of Texas. That's the opening yeah. line of I Know the End. And I, I just learned today that it was kind of an inside joke between her and some of her bandmates, because when they were on tour, one of her bandmates, they would like get out of the car somewhere like in Europe and in different, you know, cities and, and they like didn't even know where they were half the time. Right. Cause when you're touring and traveling, it can become all a blur. And I guess one of her bandmates would step out of the car and just randomly say, ah, I hate this part of Texas. It was just like (laughs) an inside joke um, that she put in the song. Uh, And then specifically the line you're talking about in Chinese satellite, um, it doesn't have a clear, annotation online about what particular song she was referencing but it is possible that um they said online that she was referencing a song by another singer songwriter named Mitski um because I guess in an interview she mentioned that that one of her songs was like one of her favorites and I, I think that came out maybe the year prior to this album so some speculate that that line is particularly about that song. 
Um, oh, okay. But I, I do love that. I do love that lyric too, because I think as a songwriter, you just, sometimes you hear a song and you just keep playing it over and over and you just like, you're like, man, I wish I had wrote this song. So then you just go, you just go and you're like, okay, I'm going to just start, you know, singing and learning the words. And I, I think specifically too, they th- people thought it was about this Mitski song because the line before it, she mentions about drowning out morning birds. And there's a line in that Mitski song where she sings about uh, morning birds. So specifically that's where it, why people think that. Oh um, yeah. Just hearing that, I agree with them then. <laughs> There's other lyrics too um, that I think also can maybe be a little reminiscent of Elliot Smith. Um, going back to uh, Garden Song, she sings the, the very first line is Someday I'm going to live in your house up on the hill. And there's an Elliot Smith song or an album from the basement on the hill, right? Yes. I, so some some I, people kind of wondered if that was a reference. Yeah, and especially because doesn't she talk about, like, roses in that song, too? Yeah, they're gluing roses on a flatbed. You should see it. I mean, thousands, and that could be... And I know what you're about to say. That's maybe a, a connection to Rose Parade, right? Yes, I feel like such a conspiracist because the the from a basement on a hill reference and the rose parade reference are definitely super far reaches but i can't say that i didn't think them when i heard the album but you know why it's not so far because no um, because uh phoebe's hometown is pasadena here in california and Mm -hmm. that's and they have um something called the rose parade which is maybe where elliot smith probably got the inspiration for that, for his song, Rose Parade. Wow. So it's not even a stretch at all. Maybe she's not necessarily referencing that song, but I think she's referencing the exact same thing Elliot Smith was referencing in his own song. Wow, who would have thought? You know, she's a... Not that I think her songs are like... um, How do you say it? Like, I feel like her songs are genuine, but, like, I'm kind of shocked how genuine they are. Well, that's, that's one thing I like about this album a lot is that it feels very personal, but it's something that I don't think a lot of artists do, or at least not, uh, not a lot of the artists I listen to, but like, okay, she, her songwriting, I don't know if you're going to agree with me or not, like, especially this album gives me a little bit of Ben Folds vibes in the sense that the lyrics can be very specific and but also very personal because and maybe now we're making I'm making that comparison because Ben Folds has a song on his album Songs for Silverman called Late, which is an actual it's pretty much his version of Phoebe's song Punisher, where it's like a tribute to Elliot Smith. And in that song, Ben Folds is singing about like, you know, he never really got to meet him or know him, but he just he sings about some of the things that people told him about him that like, you know, he was told Elliot Smith, um, you know, played a mean game of basketball um, and, and stuff like that. And, I, but specifically Ben Folds, he, I, he's very detail oriented about, and about very things that you, like a lot of songwriters don't think about. And I kind of feel like Phoebe Bridgers does a lot of that same, same kind of songwriting. Now her songs sound completely different. But she also has that humor. I mean, Ben Folds definitely, I think, has more humor. Like, he, he has a whole songs where there's just a joke song, pretty much, right? Um, right, right. Not quite maybe as silly as, like, the Bare Naked Ladies, where, like, you know, they have songs that are just, like, almost comedy songs. This is, like, Weird Al, but not quite a parody. But <laughs> Ben Folds does have a lot of humor in his lyrics. And, again, on this album, there is a lot of humor. Um or just really bizarre lyrics. Um, diving into a song that we haven't really talked about yet, um, Halloween, there's a line in the song that I'm sure you probably didn't understand, where in the second verse, she sings the line, they killed a fan down by the stadium, was only visiting, they beat him to death. Now, that line is specifically about... Uh, a fan 
beating and killing another fan at um, the Dodger Stadium back in, I think, 2003. Um, the Giants were playing, and one of the Dodgers fans, like, I think they, there was an argument and literally beat him to death. And wow. And that, that really stuck to her for some reason. And she was having a hard time finishing the lyrics to that song. And um, at the time, uh, before this album came out, she was in a couple different side project bands. She did a band um, called Better. Oh, I'm going to get it wrong. I'm not going to say yet. Let me look it up. She was in a band. I don't know if you know the band Bright Eyes. I've heard of them. Um, the lead singer, Connor Oberst, he actually helped co-write some of these songs on Punisher. Um, he helped co-write Halloween and I think Savior Complex. And he's actually the vocal. He, uh, near the end of the song, you hear a male vocalist and that's him. Oh, okay. Um, which it's funny because when I heard that male vocalist at the end of Halloween, I kind of thought it was that vocalist sounded a little bit like Elliot Smith. And then I come to find out because I, I, Bright Eyes is not a band I know. I literally only know one song by them, which is Four Winds, which is a song that the Killers ended up covering. And that's the only reason I know that song. But um, Connor Ober is the lead singer of Bright Eyes actually did a whole album with Phoebe and the, al- the name of the band was called better oblivion community center. And they released, what? and they released one self-titled album in 2019, which was a year, year before this album. So um, like I said, he was helping her write some of these songs, co-write them. And when she was like, I can't finish the lyrics to Halloween. What should I, what, what should they be? And she, he was like, you should write about something that really interests you. Like you always are telling me about that, you know, that fan getting killed at the Dodger stadium, put that in the song. And that seems kind of random. And like I said, that's something that Ben Folds would do, but she ties it together because before that line, she sings always surprised by what I would do for love. Some things I never expect. So, and then she sings about, so I, I think that line is supposed to set up the Dodger Stadium line by saying, like, some people are so much in love by something, like someone being in love by a sports team, so much that it's, you get surprised by what you would do for love. And in that sense, it's kind of like, again, someone was killed over baseball, which is, like, you know, pretty dumb, you know, but it's what you would do for love that sometimes you, you're surprised by. Um and the whole song is, I think, interesting because it's she's singing about Halloween and about like you know it's the one time of the year where you you can be anything, anyone other than yourself. Um, so what what did you think about this song in particular? Well, I like that it starts off with a joke. I hate living by the hospital. The sirens go all night. I used to joke that if they woke you up, somebody better be dying. And I instantly think of Shrek when I think about that. I think it's like Shrek two and like. Um, the king's like gets turned into a frog and he's dying that whole thing so i always like that but to me the song just really lyrically feels disconnected even hearing i, I mean I, I am glad that you told me about the the whole sports team thing that makes a lot more sense but it just i'm just not quite sure i don't know like i just don't really see how everything goes together um and it's not that i don't like the song I do like, um, you know, like her delivery of a lot of the lines, um, and the the whole male vocalist thing. I did notice him in there, and I thought it was interesting that it was not the same as the vocalist in Garden song. So that's cool that she's you know just grabbing people, like you said, while her tour manager and bandmates and stuff. Um. I don't know. Do you think this is like a grower song? Am I looking at it, it is, the wrong way? No, it is a grower song because it was one that like musically it kind of starts off with that little kind of moody guitar, little acoustic guitar lick, you know? Mm-hmm. And then as the song goes on, it gets a little bit, it's not a song that drags, but it is a song that I like, 
I, I it is kind of like a moodier song. And like I said, I like the love the first opening line where um she sings about, you know, sirens keeping you up at night, living next to the hospital. But it's it's a song that I, I appreciate because I, I think like I said, what it, it's basically a song where it's like about you and a significant other, a relationship that's kind of falling apart. And yeah. It's like kind of her, not quite pleading, because it does not sound like a song where she's pleading, but it's like a song where it's like, like, she even says, like, come on, man, we can be anything. So it's almost like the opposite of me. It's like her going, like, come on, like, this is the one time of year we can, like, actually, like, be someone else. She even says, too, when you've been drinking and you're wearing a mask. So it's, and obviously a mask you wear on Halloween, but I think it's a double meaning, like a, a mask that you hide behind, you know? Uh, and at the end of the song, yeah. when Connor Oberst comes in, he sings, whatever you want, I'll be whatever you want, which I think is like, you know, kind of him telling her like what she wants to hear. But I, I think it's a song like the more you listen to the lyrics, you might connect to it more. But I do think, yeah, musically, this like, it seems like every other song on this album does have like a part like where it gets a little softer because like. This after Punisher, that's my one issue. A little bit of the track listing is like these two back to back, Punisher and Halloween. I do think they drag a little, but then you get hit with Chinese Satellite, which sounded like that was one that you enjoyed more. Yes, I did enjoy that one a little more. Um, I I think, um, well, something that I like about it is I do like the lyrics a lot in that one. Um, I like the idea of saying that she would. Um, like embarrassingly hold a picket sign and protest if that means that like she could um like believe in a faith that would let her see you know this person that when she dies um i mean that's what that's what i picked up from it maybe i'm way off on that meaning but it, that's what it sounds like and i've always thought i don't know i feel like that was something that i could kind of connect with like you know like how far would you go to you know to do something, to believe in something. No, you're um, you're spot on with that. Whew, okay, I got one right. But it's even more it's even more specific than you think because oh. um, it's a song where she's dealing with the fact that she's agnostic, and it's a song I can relate to because I'm also agnostic, and you know she doesn't really have a faith. But it, like you said, it's a song about like wanting to kind of believe in a faith and there's a lyric in the chorus I think where she sings I want to believe which right um, and, and it's funny because this song like she's specifically I mean she's talking about a religion she's talking about faith right and like you said she's like she kind of breaks it into the idea of a relationship of like oh I would believe and something if that meant I could see you after we die. Because, you know, she specifically says, you know, that there's, like, nothing after you die, you know. And she goes to the point of saying, like, you know, she's talking about the evangelicals and, and she's what, what, saying... What does, she, what does she mean when she says that, like, or I think the dude in the song says that, like, I won't be your vegetable? So, okay, so... That seems like a weird way to phrase something. Well, in that sense, she uh, she's singing about when you're on, like, like you're in a coma mm-hmm. and you're hooked up to the machines, you're a vegetable. Like, you, you're technically not dead, but you're not alive. Yeah. And, you know, the doctors at some point tell you, like, we don't know if this person will ever wake up from a coma, right? Like, you're considered a vegetable. And I think specifically this song kind of connects to a song off her her, uh, first album called Killer, where in that song, she's kind of singing about her having like an illness and she tells the, she tells like the, her, her significant other in the song that like, pull the plug on me, which is a a devastating line. And I kind of think this is a little bit of a callback to that song where, you know, she says, I'll never be your vegetable, you know, like. It's specifically, she's saying that 
she thinks that when you're gone, it's forever. Like there's no heaven. There's nothing else after. And which makes it, I think, more powerful that she sings that. But, you know, if I could see you when I die, I would, I would be like the, the evangelicals. I would be out on the corner of the street with a picket sign. And even though it would, it would embarrass her, she would do that to see this person again. Um, but and then the last chorus of the song, you know, again, she's singing, I want to believe, which some people went even were creative with the song because some people think she's almost seen religion as like, you know, maybe like a God or the afterlife as almost like alien because first of all, I want to believe when you think of that, what do you think of? Um, isn't that like aliens kind of like X-Files, right? Yeah. The poster he has that, uh, David Duchovny has on his wall that says, I want to believe with the UFO. And then after that, she sings, I want to believe that if I go outside, I'll see a tractor beam coming to take me where I'm from. And I saw that. And some people online saw that as like, you know, in the, in a sci-fi movie where like, there's an alien abduction and like, you see the light and then the UFO comes down and then takes a person or like a cow or whatever. And I think that that's kind of like, uh, she's kind of painting that imagery of like she wants to believe in something else and she's ready for her to be taken to heaven or whatever comes after it. Um, I, I do like that. She did use a more like a much more neutral. Uh, well, I like that. She's kind of um, illustrating it with the idea of kind of like you're saying like an alien abduction, because I kind of feel like it, it leaves by being absurd. It kind of leaves you know what's after life you know what actually happens it even leaves that even more mysterious than it was at the start of the song yeah and i and i i we haven't even touched on like the title of the song chinese satellite which you know she sings in the song she wished hard on it's like wishing on a shooting star but she's wishing on a chinese satellite right yeah and but even more so she's singing about um taking a tour to see the stars, but they weren't out tonight. Now, you can take that literally. Like she went out to see stars, but remember she's from LA. And I think that's also like a double meaning of you could, you can in LA take tour buses that are supposed to take you past celebrities houses. And I think that's um... also a reference to that as well. So again, that's another thing I love about this album that there's so many double meanings and it's not even like his, like tragically hip. I know when we did that episode, I was like telling you historical facts, right? But yeah, with this album, it's it's lighter than that, which I enjoy too, because it's like double meanings when it comes to like things like mental health, emotions, relationships, you know. And um, I do think that song in particular, Chinese Satellite, it has more of an upbeat feel. Not as upbeat as Kyoto, but it has drums, right? And it's yeah the it, build is really nice in the song it, it's pretty casual but i think it, it's done really well yeah it, it definitely once you kind of hit the end of the song you felt like it went somewhere right yes good way to put it um so and, and may i chime in with something yeah so you were mentioning ben folds earlier right mm-hmm. well ben folds five as you know has a song called Mess, where the whole chorus, you know, the the refrain is, and I don't believe in God, so I can't be saved. And it's done kind of, kind of in that, like, you know, a cry for help type of way. And, you know, when you were kind of reading the lyrics for this song, it kind of actually reminded me of, you know, like that type of vibe. Yeah, I can see that. It's, yeah, it's, because Mess is like, definitely a, like a, even more of a, maybe cynical approach to faith and not, and not having faith, which by the way, that's a great song. I actually just spun um, that album a couple days ago. And I forgot how much I love that song. Oh, you actually um, own that on record on oh, yeah. vinyl. It got reissued a couple of years ago on red vinyl to match the album cover. Sick. And it sounds pretty nice. Um, but yeah, I, I definitely agree with that comparison. Um, 
I, I do want to jump over to uh, ICU. What, what did you think of that song? Well, let, I, I'm going to make a comment. Well, I guess it's a question. Is, is this your favorite song off the album? No, my favorite song is probably still Kyoto. And I do sometimes when I hear an artist for their first time, like, okay, with the Killers, the first, pro- I mean, I probably have heard Mr. Brightside before I heard anything from Famstown, but the song that I heard from them that made me want to check them out was When You Were Young. And even though there's other songs by them that I think are maybe technically better than that song, I think When You Were Young will always be like my favorite because it like, got me into them. And I think, I think that'll be the one that um well always been my favorite and so Kyoto I think will be that for me because that song like there's like not one wasted lyric there's not one like cliche lyric and the music on that song always just makes me like in a feel good mood even though the song's not necessarily a feel good song but the musically I think it is especially with the horns but I see you is probably my top three for sure that's funny because the reason I'm asking is because in our last episode with light grenades, um, I believe you said your favorite was, um, is it, it was it diamonds and coal, right? Because you were yes. saying how much you loved when, you know, songs start off with like a palm muted, you know, chord progression with eighth notes. And it's like, just kind of feel good, simple progression. And that's what this song starts off with. Yeah, it starts off similarly. Um, so I, I was just making sure that that statement held true. Yeah, it's, it's, this one though even has a cooler opening because it starts off with like the drums and the guitars kind of hitting a downbeat at once with this really faint vocal melody. And then when it gets into the first verse, yeah, it kind of does that thing that you're talking about, like the palm uni. Um, and I, this this song, I think, is the second most upbeat after Kyoto. It definitely is not as loud. And, you know, Kyoto, it's almost an outlier, outlier when it comes to, like, the upbeat songs on the album. But, yeah, this one musically was one that I connected with right off the bat. Um, but also lyrically, I think this is also one of my favorites on the album. But is it one that you enjoyed, or was is this another one that was kind of, like, it has to grow on you still. Um, this was one where I think, you know, on my first listen, not that I was, you know, it's not that I was exhausted with the album, but it um, being one of the more upbeat songs on it, I definitely liked it because it felt refreshing. And I think that still holds true. But I feel like, um, you know, now that I was able to hear the song more and, you know, get used to it, that I am enjoying it, you know, the more I listen to it. Um, I think my, I, I do think something that kind of keeps me from loving it and what I'm kind of working through is that I think it's kind of a generic song in a way, but I, I don't think the quality, you know, is subpar. Like, um, I, even though I guess maybe it's just kind of a simple line, I really like how she was saying that, like, if you're a work of art, then I'm standing too close. I can see the brush strokes. Like, I thought that was, you know, just a real, like, cool line, as well as, um, she mentioned something where, like, now she can't even get you to play the drums. Um, which, which something that I've noticed a lot is there is a lot of, like, music references, whether it's, um, different artists instruments um you know just her songwriting like how she kind of like alludes to it and whatnot um but yeah this is one that i'm enjoying more on each listen and i I think it's really important on the album because that it has more energy um especially like i feel like it sets up graceland too pretty well um you know switching from like the kind of upbeat to like a very acoustic based song so, um, I'm gonna have to listen to it standalone without, you know, listening to the whole album and, you know, maybe I'll get a different experience out of it. Who knows? Well, I will, I'm going to give you some context. I'm going to make you enjoy the song even more. Okay. Cause. Okay. Is, is there like a user guide with this uh, album? Cause I feel like that would be really great because I'm definitely. 
well, getting a lot out of this. <laughs> no, I mean, I guess the music guide that I use, which is the music guide most people use nowadays, is genius.com, which can be kind of sketchy because my issue with genius is like like Wikipedia, you, someone can make an annotation and you'll see annotations that people downloaded because it was just someone's opinion without any like evidence or facts to back it up. But what Genius has done specifically with this album was they interviewed Phoebe for each song. So if you go to Genius.com and go to the lyrics of each song and you click more about and scroll down, it'll actually have her a couple paragraphs talking about the song. And then not only that, but then like on Genius.com, lines that have a specific meaning or background are highlighted. When you click on it, it gives you an annotation with someone talking about it. And... This album, I did like when I looked at the lyrics today, because I thought I knew a lot lyrically about what the songs were about, but there was a lot of hidden things that I did not know about. And at, listening today, I actually, do, while researching it, maybe appreciate the album even more because I was a little iffy giving this album in the first place because the idea of this series, album for album, was for one of us to give the other person an album that they really enjoy and love that the other person hasn't heard before. And this this album. I listened to it a good amount between 2020 when it came out and this year, but it's not an album that I like have in my top 10, top 20 and, you know, fully completely. It maybe is not in my top 10 or 20 either. And that's what I recommended you last month. But I do think with this album, it's an album that I'm enjoying more and more. And I was just, it's definitely outside of my realm of music I listen to and, I think kind of outside your, your realm too. So that's kind of why I was really curious on what you would think about it. But researching the song particularly, you're, you're talking about the lines about your work of art, standing too close, the brush strokes. Well, the first line in the song, she sings, laying down on the lawn, I'm trying to get in the house. And that line actually might allude to a famous painting that was done in 1948 called Christina's World. It was done by a American painter named Andrew Wyeth. And the picture is, it's a painting of this lady lying in the grass facing away from like a farmhouse. And because she references painting in the second verse, people think specifically referencing that particular painting, which I think is cool. It's kind of I could see that. When uh, whenever I hear those first lines, like what I imagine is that like you're a kid and you're out, you know, you're trying to get home or you're trying to get to your, into your house, but it's like locked and like they didn't leave a key out or something. So you just stop trying, you're just laying down waiting for them to come home. <laughs> well, and this song specifically is about a breakup she had, right? And I, I think if you listen to the lyrics, like the lyrics, like you said, maybe that's why you thought the song was a little bit more like standard, kind of like a more of a basic song because of that. But it's specifically with the breakup she had, I guess, with her drummer, who is actually her drummer now in her live band, her touring band, and I think the band she uses in the studio. And they still play together, and I, she said they're still like really close friends, but. That's why she sings that line, I can't even get you to play the drums because he's literally a drummer in her band. Oh, um, wow. And I think the song is, she said, I, I want to say that she like imagined the song like her like at night, like trying to get into the house, they were having an argument. And at the end of the song, she thinks about climbing through the window, but she's like, uh, right now it feels too good not to stand. So in her mind, this whole song is in the perspective of what she would do if she got in the house, but she never makes it in the house, which I think is also a cool premise for a song. But this song also has one of my favorite lyrics in the whole album, um, which is another kind of humorous line where she says, I hate your mom. I hate it when she opens her mouth. It's amazing to me how much you can say when you don't know what you're talking about. Amen. And that specifically was about her ex mother who I guess like she ran into a like a store and she was like talking to Phoebe about Trump 
and <laughs> I guess that's that's where that line originated from. So, and, and so the writing scheme of that, whatever reason, too, of that line, I really like. Um, and yeah, I just and and, I, and probably one of my favorite lines too on it is, um, in the last verse, she says, "Because I don't know what I want until I fuck it up." which I think is a very relatable line because I think we've all probably had that moment where it's like you're, you know, in life, you like, sometimes you don't know what you want. And then when you figure out, you know what you want, it's like too late. Yeah. You know? Like whether it comes to like school or careers or opportunities and stuff like that. Um, And then one last thing about the song that I want to run by you is some people thought Oh, and by the way, really quick, too. The song is called I See You. It's spelled literally I See You. And originally, it wasn't necessarily supposed to be about, like, the hospital, even though she does sing about the hospital on Halloween. But uh, when the song came out, remember, because this album came out in 2020, during the start of COVID, and when she originally released the song, she changed the title to I See You, like, the actual, like, you know, I see you, and like not, you know, not the letters I see you, but I see you, which is what she sings in the song, right? Uh, but then she, by the time the album was released, she decided to change it back to I see you because she changed it in the first place because she thought it was a little insensitive with COVID going on and people actually like filling up the ICUs and stuff. But um, I, I think, you know, and obviously she wrote the song before COVID even was a thing. So I don't think it's insensitive whatsoever. But I, I think I like I like that that like you said something because the the refrain of the song, the chorus where she's singing, I feel something when I see you now, is a little like you said maybe generic, but right some, and which is why I think it's clever that she changed it to I see you, but some people think it might be a reference to another Ellie Smith song, one called Oh Well Okay. Okay. Because in in the song, he sings, if you get a feeling next time you see me, do me a favor and let me know. Oh, my gosh. And I guess that's the song that he wrote about his... Was that the one he wrote? There's there's another song where he they reference a song that he wrote about his mom. I don't know if it's that one. Um, Well, I I feel like... I don't think that one has to do with his mom. Doesn't, I've always that, thought about that song as kind of like losing kind of your losing the feeling of yourself, you know, and then just kind of like everything's kind of feeling gray in that, that way. So you're looking for that, you know, if you can see the life in me, you know, let me know that that's how I always saw it. But, but yeah, so some people think wrong. that that lyric is maybe a reference to that song. Um and maybe not you know, even intentionally, you know, but just kind of subconsciously she wrote it because she probably listened to that song a good amount of times. Yeah, okay, that's interesting. Now, I'm definitely going to be going listening back to this after with that in mind. And, you know, when I listen to this on um, Spotify, um, sorry, I'm not paying you directly, Phoebe. Uh, um, I Like, afterwards, an Elliot Smith song started playing, you know, because it's, it's very similar, I guess. Yeah, I... I do think this album has musically, like, you know, I guess I'll ask you this now. I, we, I do want to cover the, the last two songs on the album, especially the last song. Um, but, like, did, would it have been better had I not mentioned you anything about Elliot Smith when it came to this album? Hmm. Like, did it take that a little away from you because you were maybe purposely you know, looking out for references to Elliot Smith musically or lyrically or, you know, do you think when you listen to it, you're like, you don't understand the comparisons at all, which makes you maybe like this album less? No, I I think if anything, you know, it kind of added to the, I think if anything, it made it a little more interactive for me Um, because when I listen to the songs now, you know, like, once I listen to it, like, you know, you know, twice, I stopped really looking for them. And then I just noticed them if they showed up or something. Um, and even in Elliot's music, he makes 
a lot of references to other artists, um, particularly like the Beatles. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I like when you hear musicians nodding to other musicians, like, I think that's just a fun thing. Um, and I, something I speculate is maybe if I didn't have the whole Elliot Smith comparison in my mind, maybe I would have a harder time figuring out how to view the album, you know, how I should enjoy this album. Um, and I, I think also too, um, having us discuss Tom Waits' Small Change, a very lyric based album, I think that also kind of really prepared me to, you know, to really take in Punisher, you know, and digest it and stuff. Get that. Um, before we move on to the last songs, I, we did kind of skip over Moon Song, and I kind of att- not intentionally did that, but I will say Moon Song is actually one of my least favorites on the album because I do it's think that's kind of boring, kind of slow. It's yeah, the music on that one doesn't do a whole lot for me. I know you mentioned the the whole. Um, John Lennon line, you know, we fought over John Lennon, which which is a cool concept because it's specifically I know she said she wrote that lyric because she, you know, she wrote that lyric because like there are some people who like idolize Lennon when in reality he, you know, had a bit of a troubled past and, you know, physically abused women and how like, you know, we shouldn't idolize him for that. Um and then even more so, I like the line before where she sings, you know, we we hate tears in heaven, but it's sad his baby died. And she said she originally had a different lyric just that said, we hate Eric Clapton. And, <laughs> um, and I think that line has aged even better over time because since COVID, he's come out as an anti-vaxxer and just really, he just does not seem like mentally there when it comes to like, his views on certain things. Um, and he's, and I know like even before then he was, some people perceive him personally, like on a personal level as like an asshole. And I just never cared for his music to begin with, but it's funny because she says that tears in heaven is actually one of the songs she likes by him. But she said in the song, it made more sense to sing that they don't like the song. Cause she says she doesn't like most of his music because she thinks it's a little kind of pretentious. But she's like, I, Tears in Heaven is actually the one song I don't mind by him. But Tears in Heaven is a really beautiful song. But yeah, she thought it was more poetic to to have that line the way it was. But yeah, Moon, Moon Song doesn't do a lot for me. I, I mean, I like the fact that she's singing about, um, like, I would give, I would, you know, give the moon to you, which is like a direct quote from It's a Wonderful Life, you know, the Christmas uh, film. But yeah, musically that one doesn't do a lot for me. And I will say too, on the first couple of listens, Graceland Two didn't do a lot for me. But that one has been a grower. I don't know how you feel about that one. Well, real quick, real quick. Um, I feel like there's a lot in Moon Song. Something that I don't know how I really feel about. It. I guess I don't really have a sort of opinion with it. But I feel like there's a lot of like dog-like lines. So there's literally literally a line where it says um so i will wait for the next time you want me like a dog with a bird at your door but there's also you know the first line you asked me to walk you home but i I had to carry you i feel like you know you could even put that to a dog i know that's a stretch but then also um like i don't i (laughs) i guess i guess i kind of lost my thought there at that one but i don't know like i feel like it's all over the place there's another line, and I know the end where she sings about having a bird in your teeth. I don't know if maybe that. Yeah, was yeah, that was it. That was it. Uh, yeah, I think that's a very interesting concept because I think the purpose of that line was showing, like, um, you know, a dog will bring like a bird to you as like a gift, but we see it as something that's like disgusting and gross, right? Right. Um, and I think it's kind of clever that she brings it back up and. Um, I know the end. So I do like that you picked that up because I, I was going to mention that and I, and I completely forgot. Uh, okay, now I don't feel crazy anymore. Thank you for the validation. But yeah, Grace Land 2, it's got a little banjo in it and is by far the most country slash folk song on the album. 
Did that bother you musically? <laughs> oh, sorry. No, um, uh, it's, especially on a few more listens, I do really appreciate the um, like the banjo and the, you know, like the higher pitch acoustics. I'm not sure if it's just acoustic guitar, but um, I do really like that change in scenery. What I don't really like is like the rest of it. Like, and when I say the rest of it, I guess I'd mostly mean just like the story of it. Um, it it just hasn't really grabbed me. And you know, maybe one day I'll hear it and I'll you know just think of it different, and then you know maybe it'll click for me. But I just that was one that I had a, had a hard time like getting close to. If that makes sense. Well, and that's kind of how I thought on it on first couple listens because. The music was a little maybe too folk country for me even. And I listen to a little bit more of that music than you do, I think. But um, this one I kind of got more into the more I like read into what the song was about. Because I don't know if you noticed, the kind of near the middle and end of the song, there's some harmonies. And they're not actually done by her. They are done by a couple of her friends who are also music- musicians. Um, Julian Baker and Luke, uh, Lucy Dacus. They also created a super group that is entitled Boy Genius. And they released a, I don't think it was a full album, it was an EP in 2018. So again, before this album came out. And both those other two musicians, Julian Baker and Lucy, Lucy Dacus, they're kind of similar music to her. To Phoebe Bridgers, and I haven't given them a listen. I've kind of heard songs or two, and they just didn't hit me as much as some of Phoebe Bridgers' songs um, do. But um, they helped her with the harmonies in the song, and I think lyrically they're kind of about the both of them, specifically Julian, Julian Baker, because I I want to say that she like had some drug issues and she went to rehab for. And I think when you listen to the song, you listen to the lyrics. It's, the song starts off like someone leaving rehab. No longer a danger to herself or others. She made up her mind and laced up her shoes, which some people are like, they take away your shoes when you go into rehab, right? Because if you're like feeling suicidal, you know? Right, right. And, um, and as the song goes on, she's singing about how like, you know, she can go home now if she wants to, but she's not going to. And she ends up going to Memphis and, you know, she there's a line about predictably winds up thinking about Elvis. And then I, I want to know where this uh, the song title came from, Graceland 2, because when I saw that song title, I immediately thought of the Treasure of the Hip song, Grace 2. And I'm like, oh, is huh. that a coincidence? And it is a coincidence because Grace 2, that's always a song that no one's really figured out exactly what it means. But Graceland 2 has specific meaning. Graceland 2 is so you know graceland you know the you know the museum about elvis and and all that but outside of of graceland there's this house that this guy used to own where his whole he turned his whole house into a mini museum about elvis and people refer to it as graceland two and like two as in like number two but i i guess graceland two like as well you know and mm. yeah, so that's where this title comes from. And you know, the song does have that kind of Memphis sound a little bit, you know, maybe more of like a Nashville sound. But again, she mentions about she mentions the line about Elvis, and um, as the song goes on, you know, the ending is them singing whatever she wants. You know, I would do anything, whatever you want. And so I think it's a song about being there for someone, especially someone going through a hard time. So I do really appreciate the song. Musically, it's not my favorite, even though I do think it stands out amongst the other songs. But yeah, it, that one is still growing on me. I do think I like it more. I think Moon Song is my least favorite, if we're not counting the you know instrumental DVD menu. Um, but I will say the song that grew on me the most is the last song. And before I even mention anything about the last song, I'm just curious what you thought about it. I know the end. You know, on first listen, I do agree that it was not like my favorite. Um, Not that I disliked it, but I just, 
I think just because it was the end of the album and it takes a while to get going. Um, but that's kind of the, that's the point of the song though. So that, that's fine. Um, and there's some real nice harmonies in it. Um, but the, you know, the best part of the song, of course, is like the last half really builds up. Um, and I really like the, tr- like the, the horns that come into, and it, it kind of reminds me of the frames actually. Um, you know how it's like a very, um, it's like a very gradual build. And it really does explode. And, you know, when it explodes, all of a sudden, the whole, you know, tame part of the song just feels so much bigger, you know, like it it has more of an impact. And you're probably specifically thinking of frame songs like um, Santa Maria or Keepsake or Stuff in Silence, right? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, I I totally agree with you that. And I kind of thought I thought you were going to like that ending. For sure, because it gets chaotic and it has like really weird vocals at the end too, where they're like yelling. Mm-hmm. And the music just seems to get more and more intense. Um, and I kind of feel exactly how you did. Like, I, I'll say this: I know the end was a single from her, and when the album was released, it was everyone's favorite. Wait, but it was it, a single? Yeah, and. Critics, it was their, a lot of the critics, it was their favorite, and a lot of fans, it was their favorite. And when I heard it the first time, even the ending part, I was a little disappointed by it. And I was like, yeah, the ending's kind of cool, but the rest of the song, I don't know. It just sounds like another one of the kind of slower songs on the album. But it's grown on me a lot. Like, I do think musically, the first half of it is like, it's not as memorable, but I do think lyrically, the first part is great. We already mentioned the Germany, Texas line. Um, She has a lot of references to like uh, the wizard of Oz. I don't know if you caught that where she sings three clicks and I'm home. There's no place like my room, which is cool. Hey, that, Hey, that's also an Elliot Smith reference clearly because he did have a song from like, like a really young recording um, called I love my room. And it's just, you know, there's no place like my room. Well, there you go. Oh, conspiracy. And then um, the, the first half of the song, it's, it is weird, the song, because like, the first half, I feel like it's about someone specifically. Um, I love the line where she says, I'm always pushing you away from me, but you come back with gravity. I just really like the, mm-hmm. like, the rhyme flow of that. It's like a very hard hitting line. And then she sings about the bird in your teeth, which I think is a reference to uh, Moon Song. And uh, again, there's a line about when the sirens sound, you'll hide under the floor. I'm not going to go down with my hometown in a tornado. Which, again, I think is another reference to the Wizard of Oz. But then, yeah, when you get to that third verse, the music kind of just it changes, right? It goes more into that kind of palm mute, kind of down, you know, down strum, right? And it kind of yeah. picks up pace a little bit. And the the singing melody kind of changes. It it's it really is kind of like two songs to me. Maybe that's the part I don't love about it is like I feel like they're almost separate because the ones that that second part hits, that's where I'm really invested in. Her lyrics get really specific, but in a cool way because I think the idea of the third verse, the last part of the song, is her taking a road trip and. Um, it's kind of a little bit about, I think, the apocalypse because she's singing about letting the ultraviolet cover me up. And um, I think that has to do with like ozone layers. Uh, when I looked it up, she specifically was thinking about like the apoc- apocalypse. And um, she sings the line, windows down, screams along to some America first rap country song, which I thought was a funny line. Right, yeah. Uh, and specifically, she might have been referencing Old Town Road because um, this came out the year after um, Old Town Road was um, the number one song for like forever. Okay, I was wondering if it was that. But that's she, also the first I thought about. She specifically, I, I think in a tweet, she mentioned that she couldn't remember what song, but she said it was either a Jason, um, Al, a Jason Aldean song or a Sam Hunt song, which are just two other like average country singers right country pop singers i'll say 
Uh, but then, like, she gets really specific. She's like, a slaughterhouse, an outlet mall, slot machines, fear of God. And they're just, like, very specific, vivid lines that I really like. Slot machines, I think, could be a, maybe a callback to, to Kyoto, where they're singing about going to the arcade. Um, fear of God could be a reference to Chinese satellite talking about religion. And then a she's singing. A house with a picket fence, talking about a picket sign earlier. Exactly. I had the same thought. She's singing about an alien spaceship, government drone. And then she's singing mm-hmm. about like lightning and she's singing like, it's almost like she's driving into like the storm. And then again, with the Chinese satellite, with the, you know, evangel- evangelics, they're talking about, um, she sees a billboard that says the end is near. And that's something that that type of religion is always talking about. Like, oh, the end is here. You know, like, remember the whole, what was it, 2012, where people thought that was going to be the end of the world? Yeah. And every year they come up with a new year, like, oh, it's going to be 2023 or it's going to be 2024. Right, because some sort of uh, Aztec calendar or something. (laughs) And then, But then the funny thing is, like, as the song progresses musically, it does sound like it's the apocalypse. Like, it gets so chaotic and crazy that it really feels like everything's going off the rails, you know? Horns it it does in, feel like a windstorm. And then those vocals come in and they're so dark and they're like yelling like, ah. Like, at first I thought it was a little corny and cheesy over the top, but I really like it now. So um, I, I do think the ending is great. There's a little like um, bass part too that kind of happens that I think with headphones you can really hear it. That sounds cool. Um, I, I really like that last... Um... The little last um, stanza that, no, I'm not afraid to disappear. The billboard said the end is near. I turned around. There was nothing there. Yeah, I guess the end is here. Yeah. And because I-, I could almost see that almost like because earlier she talks about like she doesn't want to go down with her town or, you know, whatever that vibe. Um, And so it's almost kind of like she looks back like she could be looking back at her town because she's like driving to the storm. You know, she's kind of narrating. That maybe, you know, it's like, oh, this is the end of that part of my life. Or maybe like, you know, wow, there really is nothing here for me. And, you know, like that was the end of it. Yeah, but I I also think, too, it could be just like a another kind of song where she talks about like she doesn't know what's going to happen after life, you know, like after you die. But that when it happens, she'll be ready for it, you know. So, mm. again, it's another song where I think it have, like, a double meaning. Like, yeah, she's singing about this, like, tornado, apocalypse, spaceship thing. But then she would also just be talking about, like, real life, you know. So, and then, to top it all off, something that I love when albums do this, there's kind of a little bit of a loop in the sense that right when those horns kick in, you hear the melody that is being played in DVD menu. It's the same melody. Like, I think it's like right before all the Oz at the end of I, I Know the End. There's like that. Da, 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 da. It's that same melody from DVD menu, the opening instrumental track. And it's like a and, little callback. And shame on me, but I did not notice it. I did not until you pointed it out. And then that was a little bit of a game changer. <laughs> and then, but then think about this. So DVD menu, you think uh, maybe it's a random name she came up for that first song because it's an intro with no lyrics. It's short. It, it leads into the first real song, which is garden song. And some people thought maybe she named it that because like, it maybe sounds like, you know, when you have a DVD menu screen, where it's just playing the same music and shots from the scene over and over and over in a loop. Like maybe that music sounds like that, but I don't think so. Cause that the intro music to, to D- DVD menu to me, is more like pretty and dark, kind of almost creepy. It kind of gives me Radiohead vibes, especially from Radiohead's, Radiohead's album, A Moon Shape Cool. But I thought the reason she put that, that instrumental melody into the last song on the album, um, I know the end is because she wants it to loop like a DVD menu would do. When you finish a DVD on your DVD player, what does it do? It goes right back into that DVD menu. <laughs> so 
So I don't know if that was the intention, but I love to think that that's what happened and that's why it happened. Um, yeah, it it definitely does have the potential to be like, yeah, to loop into it. Like it does really fit. Um, like like the way it goes to Garden sounds great, and kind of the way that it goes into um, DVD menu. You know, from I know the end is what what is it even called? The, the last end. song on the album. I know the end. Just I know the end. Um, well, the way that, you know, transitions into DVD menu would be re- really cool to hear. Like, you know, looped. And I, and I do have one more last question here, because we, we should be wrapping this up. Um, we've been talking about for a while, but um, we talk a lot about the music and the lyrics. Um, one last thing I want to ask you about was, what do you think of her singing voice? Because we talk about lyrics, we talk about the music, and you love the lyrics, I think you're still kind of getting a hook on the lyrics, a grasp on them. We'll have some of the music and production, some others you think is a little, maybe sounds the same, a little too slow. But what do you think of the vocals? So I guess I don't really listen to too many female singers, not for any particular reason. Um, But like the two that I think I hear, I listen to the most would probably be like Dionne Warwick and, um, Sleater Kinney. I also really like uh, Miley Cyrus's voice too. Um, um, and you know, and like, I hear a lot of modern people like Doja Cat and stuff. So like, I don't really have that many, like, that much experience, listening experience with female vocalists, but I did like her vocals, um, a, a fair amount, I would say. I never really felt like they were, you know, like annoying or like she sounded like too cocky or anything. Like I felt like, her delivery was it was definitely artistic like there was some you know like it was the right amount of dramatic to me like i think she really nailed this whole thing really i mean it it definitely is a very specific vibe it is that moody kind of um not edgy but kind of like almost there but i i think it's really balanced and i think that if she if she had a different voice then maybe I really wouldn't like the album as much. Um, like you mentioned, like this feels like a very personal album and, you know, all these specific details, you know, having you explain, you know, what she said in interviews or what the meetings could be like that really ties the album for me. Like that's kind of the glue that takes it from, Oh, I listened to this album and, you know, it's like, Oh, it's like a six out of 10. It's a good album, you know, and it pushes it to like, wow, this is like, you know, like it could be like an eight out of 10, really. Like it's, it feels like her album, which I think is super cool. And then most importantly, what did you think about the, the little who in the middle of Kyoto? <laughs> I, I did like it, honestly. How do you feel about it? That was my favorite of the song, but, um, <laughs> Last last thoughts on the album. Your overall concluding thoughts. Did you enjoy the album? Are you going to listen to it again after this? Would you be interested in checking out her first album? Well, okay. Something we didn't talk about, but I, I we probably should have was the album cover because um I, I just looked at it real quick, and it does really kind of lock in you know the the themes from like Chinese satellite and I know the end. Um, it's like her looking up and stuff. And I like the colors on it, but you know, that point being aside, I, I really do think I would listen to this album again. Um, it's very moody, which is nice. And, um, even though I feel like, you know, the best way to listen to this album is listening closely, listening to the lyrics. I think also it's something that could work really well in the background. Um, Especially maybe when you, you know, your ears kind of catch, you know, a kind of comedic line or something. Um, but thank you for suggesting it to me. Um, I, I really enjoy it. And I'm, you know, I'm, I'm going to be listening to her other album too at some point. Um, which, what is it even called? Uh, her first album is called Stranger in the Alps. It came out, I believe, in 2017. Um, really quick, it, it's funny you brought up the album cover because her kind of gimmick, I guess, for this album and tour was she wore like a skeleton costume. 
and like all her performances. And if you watch the video to Kyoto, she's like wearing a, like it's like a basic skeleton costume. And that's what she's wearing on the front cover. And okay. for her first album, it's a picture of her, I think, as a kid with like a uh, wearing like a sheet over her because it was like a cost like a ghost costume for Halloween. And that was kind ah. of her artwork for that whole like album release was like these little drawn ghost. So it is kind of interesting that, you know, um, those are kind of like the artwork themes to both albums. Uh, I don't think you like their first, her first album as much because I do think the mood is a little bit on the slower side. Uh, but it's still worth checking out a couple of great songs on it. And then if you listen to the deluxe version, she does a cover of Tom Petty's song called It'll All Work Out, which is one of his most underrated songs. Fantastic, beautiful song. Her version is great. And really quick, one last thing, kind of a little off topic, but I can't remember on what song, but on one of the songs of Punisher, she sings the line, a rebel without a cause, which is a specific quote that she stole from a Tom Petty song um, into the Great Wide Open, which is a line that Tom Petty stole from the band The Replacements. So I, I just had to throw that in there. She even said, I'm stealing the line that he stole. <laughs> Which brings you know, you I, to the point where you're talking about how she sings a lot about music specific things. Well, that's one of them. That yeah, I that's great. I love hearing stuff like that. Like I remember hearing that um Mike McCready was saying that he stole um part of the live solo from a KISS song, which stole it from a Doors song. Um yeah, so I I love that stuff. Well, cool. I'm glad you enjoyed the album. Definitely a different pacing than the hips fully completely what what do you think her costume for the next album is going to be uh i I think she's going to start wearing um like those fake teeth and be a vampire i could see that or maybe like um like a frankenstein type costume oh that'd be cool um but yeah i'm glad you enjoyed the album and i guess we'll wrap this up do we want to give each other next month's albums so the viewers, can, the listeners can um, get a jump on listening to the next two albums? I think so. I think my my pick is locked in. Okay, so what do you got for me for next month? Well, s- since we've been talking about them so much, I am giving you the challenge of listening to Elliot Smith's first posthumous album from a basement on a hill. Which I think I only know one or two songs from, if I remember correctly. Yes, which would probably be Twilight and Pretty Ugly Before. Yes, those sound familiar. Yes. Cool, I'm excited. I, th- I think you'll be shocked. Because like I said, I only know, I know those two, but I only know hand, I only know one album from him completely and then a handful from his other albums, but only one real studio album. Um, and I think it'll be a... a Big change up after White Grenades from Incubus. And similarly, I'm going to kind of switch gears with you as well. We're not going to go back to a straightforward rock album like The Hips Fully Completely. And we're not going to do singer-songwriter like Punisher. I'm going to give you Spoon's album, Hot Thoughts. Which... Now, I do know you did give me... um, You did make me a little, like, sampler pack you know of some spoon songs spoon songs that you think i would like um and i i did enjoy that but hearing an album is very different than hearing songs from an artist yes and i will get into it into the reasons why i think this particular album when we get to that episode because i unlike this the phoebe bridges album i don't want to give you too much for you to base your opinion on i want you just to kind of go into it listen to it and form your opinions that way. So, but I think that'll do it for this episode. Um, We'll be back uh, next week. um, First week of the new year with a album appreciation episode. Won't spoil what album yet, but we'll be talking about an album that we both love. And then following that uh, should be the episode for uh, album for album, Elliot Smith and Spoon. So, 
let us know in the comments what you think about this Phoebe Bridgers album, whether you've heard it for the first time or it's an album you already know and love. Go check out next month's albums. You can get a head start on that. And we will be back soon. Bye-bye.